and welcome to the debut of the Terry Collins Show. Uh, we're so excited to be with you this baseball season. Uh, we do have a great show today. We're going to be joined uh, by not one, but two great guests. Danny Martino from SNY will be joining us on the opening segment, and uh, we'll have our first talking with TC uh, joining us on that segment. The captain, number five, David Wright, one of the all-time great Mets, will be joining us. We'll hear from the fans as well with some questions for Terry. we got some amazing breaking news also to talk to you about. So let's bring on the star of the show, Mr. Terry Collins, direct from Florida. Hi, John. Hi, Greg. I'm glad to be on the show. This is very exciting for me to have my first podcast, and we've got a, some great guests today, and certainly, you know, we're going to kick it off with some great news. Yes. I mean, a matter of fact, uh, we had, a, you know, a seg- we, we, we taped – uh, a, a great segment with Andy Martino, a dear friend of yours, uh, obviously the <laughs> SNY uh, baseball analyst, the author. So we're going to be going to that. So that got a little outdated pretty quickly because as soon as we finished our taping with Andy and David Wright, we get the news. John Heyman breaks the news that the Mets go out there and sign J.D. Martinez. Huge, was huge kind move. Of a surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Very it, a big surprise. I mean, he's been out there for a long time. I, you know, he's he's gonna have to. I I know JD, and I know he's of course he he's a uh, when it comes to hitting that is his gig, and he is I'm sure studied and hitting. And he's been hitting a lot of balls, but he needs to get some live batting practice in. And you know, one of the amazing things about this time of year, you know, you can go to minor league camp because there's games every day, and you can rack up 10, 12, 14 at bats a day uh, going to those minor league games. So. I think it's great for them. It's a great bat. We, you know, we've talked many times, John, you and I, about the need for an extra another bat in that lineup. And here you've got one of the best hitters in all of baseball hitting behind Pete Alonso, and I think it's going to make a big difference in that lineup. You know, and, and Andy said because he's been posting since this uh, uh, signing was announced that the only way the Mets would do it if it made real good financial sense for them. And the agreement is really an interesting one. They sign up for one year. Twelve and a half million dollars, uh, but the big part of it is that he's only getting four point five million this year. The rest of it is going to be deferred, uh, beginning in twenty thirty four. He'll get a million and a half a year uh, until the contract is uh, is satisfied. Uh, but that kind of is a way that uh, David Stearns and and Steve Cohen sought a way to bring him in. Obviously, JD wanted to come here too. So it makes financial sense for the Mets. They don't get that big luxury tax hit, and they bring in a guy that could finally protect Pete Alonso in that lineup. A- absolutely, John. And I, you know, you know, one of, the, one of the things about being the manager, we don't care about contracts. We care about the players. <laughs> Believe me, you know. Right. And when you you bring in that guy like that into this lineup, I mean, you've got, with the guys that got ahead of him, hitting ahead of him, you know, Minimo, Lindor, Alonso. This guy's got a chance to have a huge year. And so if he signs a one-year deal like he did next year, he's got to go out. You know, he may have 130 RBIs going into next year's market and and make himself a big payday. Yeah, I mean, let's take a look at the Mets' projected lineup now. Because when you insert J.D. into that lineup, it changes the whole complexion. So now you got Nimmo leading off. You got Lindor, shortstop second base. Then you got Alonso hitting third. J.D. follows in in the cleanup spot. Then you got McNeil, Alvarez, Marte, and Brett Beatty. So you got – and then you got uh, Harrison Bader in center field. So you got one to nine, and uh, it really really gives that whole lineup a totally different look. Totally different look. You know, just like you said, that's exactly what – when I heard the news, I automatically put him in the four hole, you know, behind Pete – You've got uh, McNeil hitting behind him. And again, you know, you talk about protecting somebody having an, against right hand pitching. You have Jeff McNeil hitting behind JD Martinez. That's, that's going to be a big move for them. You know, you then follow him up with, with Marte, who everybody said is that a, you know, looks good this spring. He's back being healthy again. And, and we all know what kind of a player he can become. So you follow him with, with Alvarez, the catcher, and then Beatty, and then, or I mean, uh, Brett Beatty, and then Bader. That's a pretty, pretty, pretty good lineup. Yeah, and, and what it does also, it kind of puts uh, Mark Vientos in a little bit of a precarious spot now. But you also have that opportunity now to have that 
third base slot being more of a platoon if if uh, if if uh, Mendoza decides to go that route. Or right, and you know there's going to be job. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I no, mean, there's going to be job. It, <laughs> it gives a lot of options. Let's put it that way. Yeah, he he does, and that's. You know, Mark's going to get some at-bats. Make no mistake, he's going to get some at-bats. But, you know, here's a situation where if he shows the ability to really do damage against left-handed pitching, and that's going to let Beatty have some days off, so he's going to get some playing time uh, against left-handed pitching. You know, and that's sometimes a manager's dream, to be able to put get that lineup and get to that starting pitcher and do some damage. Yeah, and this guy, I mean, he has performed. He's 36 years old, but he had an amazing – uh, season last year, 33 home runs. Uh, he had a, a wonderful season. Uh, but what's really impressive about him, his runs in scoring position, he's a lifetime 298 hitter. Uh, I mean, he's just remarkable with runs in scoring position. Uh, even more impressive with two outs in runs in scoring position. He has a, a, a really a career slash line, 292. He's got 935 OPS. Uh, spectacular runs in scoring position numbers. And uh, he is, uh, I would guess you'd have to agree, he's one of the, he's a dependable, uh, and he's the defini- definitive run producer. And now the Mets got him. Absolutely. You know, and one of the things, you know, when you have numbers like that with runners in scoring position, that's because J.D. uses the whole field. He's very, very dangerous in right center field. And as we know, that's a spacious park, part of City Field. But you know what? Doubles work, too, to drive in runs. So uh, I just think it's a great sign for the Mets. I, I'm very, very impressed by it. Uh, you know, how those guys work these contracts to, to get these players in is amazing. Uh, but I think just think it's a great sign. Yeah, they were, you know, certainly uh, uh, keeping it close to the vest. And, and J.D. had turned down $15 million from the Giants. And he takes less to go to the Mets. So uh, it looks like he's uh, he's a big acquisition for this team as spring training wraps up. He adds a whole new dimension. Social media is going wild. The fans are going wild. Everybody's uh, all excited about it. <laughs> and it just kind of takes a look at, at the team's complexion now where, yes, they want to be competitive. But now you could say that uh, this signing kind of makes them a serious contender for postseason. No, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. Now, you know, what we've got to do now is hope that those, that starting pitching can get us to the, you know, to the seventh inning to where you can bridge the gap to get to Diaz and they're going to rack up some wins if they can do that. Yep. Well, we got an exciting first show for everybody out there. The first of the Terry Collins show. Uh, David Wright's coming on. You got some questions from the fans you're going to answer. And uh, why don't we do this right now? Earlier today, we spoke uh, with Andy Martino. So let's go to that right now all right terry let's get right into it here uh the opening of the show the first show um uh we're gonna bring on andy martino and andy has covered major league baseball uh for more than a decade a former staff writer at the philadelphia inquirer the new york daily news he's uh, written the critically acclaimed book cheated the inside story the astro scandal and also a uh, colorful history of sign stealing and uh, was one of the writers for the Mets 50th anniversary celebration that came out in 2012. He is the author of the highly anticipated upcoming book, The Yankee Way, the untold inside story of the Brian Cashman era, available for pre-order right now and coming out everywhere on May the 21st. He's currently a reporter and an analyst covering MLB for the SNY Network in New York. Let's welcome Andy Martino to the Terry Collins Show. Hello, hello, guys. This is really quite something, Terry, to be on the other side of an interview from you. (laughs) I never never thought I would see the day. How about that? You know, Andy, it goes back to a lot of the things they tell you. You know, you got to be careful how you deal with the people on the way up, which you're going to the top, because you're going to see them on the way back down now. So now you're on my show. Is that where you're going now? Yeah, that's where I'm going, yeah. That's great. It's great to have you on the show. You know, I, I, I couldn't have kicked off my first show with a better guy and a better friend. So... Thanks for coming on, and uh, you know, I think the one of the things the reasons I wanted to have you on because I, you and I had dinner down here in Florida when you were down here for spring training, and I think you and I got to discuss what we think so far. Uh, you know, as we as we're reaching the end of spring training and, and 
you know, opening days right around the corner. So what's your take on what you've seen of the Mets so far? Well, Terry, I got to say the first thing that springs to mind is Carlos Mendoza. And probably with the arrival of David Stearns being so heralded, the, the, uh, Mendoza's hiring maybe didn't get as much publicity as, as a manager hiring in New York normally would. But in some really key ways, he, to me, reminds me of when you arrived. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. I mean, obviously, you come from different mentors and different organizations and different pe- you're different people, I'm sure, in a lot of ways. But there was this feeling of like an infusion of positive energy when you got here. Uh, I remember, Terry, that was my second year covering the Mets on the beat when you got here in 2011 and right away it was like oh this guy's a live wire this this is meaning you like the, you you were so accessible and so happy to be there and so engaged with the players and in the game and just watching your energy bounce around the room and i could tell that uh players were really refreshed by that the writers are really refreshed by that the fact that we could just talk to you about baseball without there being a whole lot of you know, nonsense about like, well, where's he, what's, what's he mean by that? Where's he going with that question? You just wanted to talk about the game and the same thing went for the writers, for your players. And Mendoza's to me, uh, has that breath of fresh air energy too. So I think that is something he's going to have a learning curve. Obviously he's never managed a big league game, although he's managed it obviously in different places. Uh, but that is a long time, a long-term positive for the Mets culture. So that probably is observation number one. If you look at the team they have on the field, I think it's easy to forget that there's still a Pete Alonso, a Francisco Lindor, a Brandon Nimmo, uh, Jeff McNeil when he's right as a batting champ, Francisco Alvarez. I mean, I'm naming some really good Major League Baseball players, obviously. Um, but I think it's also fair to say that uh, they, they might be an arm or two short on the pitching side, both in the rotation and the pen. Uh, Stearns has brought in a lot of good uh, upside guys, but also – uh, you do have a rotation probably full of what you call threes and fours other than Senga, who's not healthy right now. Uh, and I just, I think it's fair to say that it's, I don't know if concern is too strong, but like, we'll see how those guys actually perform when the bell rings. And I think if the Mets find themselves on the outside, looking into the playoffs, it's probably going to be because of pitching. You could argue they're a bat short too, but I actually kind of like their offense. And I guess the final thought is I like what Stearns has done with the defense. Uh, when you think like analytics guy from Harvard, you don't necessarily automatically think that he cares about athleticism and defense. Maybe that's unfair on my part. Maybe that comes from Sandy Alderson, frankly, an athlete, a pioneer of analytics who we, we both know. Uh, and I'm just saying this not as a criticism or a compliment, but Sandy didn't have defense top of mind, right? It was how much on base percentage and offensive production can you get out of each position? That was his philosophy. He wouldn't argue with me saying that. Stearns, younger analytics type guy, brings in Harrison Bader, brings in Joey Wendell, uh, really actually cares, especially uh, about up the middle defense. And I think that's going to create a team that uh, even if they're not winning 90 games, they look pretty good because right, I don't have to tell you, when you catch the ball and are fundamentally sound and athletic, that prevents you from looking like a sloppy team, right? I mean, what, what have you seen so far? Well, you know, I, I thought what they did last, last winter, I, I'll get into Carlos in a second, but I thought what they did last winter, they got themselves some depth, you know, with the way yeah. the game is played today. You know, when you talk about pitching, you know, how, what's, what's a pitcher? I mean, we got a Cy Young Award winner who's a five-inning pitcher, and he won a Cy Young. So your bullpen is going to be key. And I, went, I thought they went out and they got themselves some pretty good arms. And, you know, even though they're, they're not huge names, but they got that guy back who pitches the ninth inning. So now all of a sudden those roles in that bullpen have changed, you know, and, and I, I still believe this. I still believe you're going to see Edwin Diaz coming in a game. Maybe it's against the New York Yankees uh, in the eighth inning when all of a sudden here comes number one, two, and three in that line, that powerful lineup. You've got LeMay, Hughes, Soto, and, and Judge coming up. You're going to see Diaz pitch the eighth inning. It, it, but it just changes what the roles are for those other guys and it lets them relax a little bit because they know that he's at the he's at the end. So I think their bullpen, if they command the ball, if they pound that strike zone because of the improved defense, it's going to make them a little bit better. I like their lineup like you do. I still think you know you, that guy at the top of the lineup is important. I, I that's why I really like Brandon Nimmo up there. He gets on base. He's done it for his entire major league career. He works the count. He he sees a lot of pitches every at bat. 
So when you lead off a game and you've got a guy that's seeing eight, nine pitches, it tells it's gonna, everybody on the bench is, you know, when he comes back there, hey, what was the slider like? What was the split like? Because he sees every pitch the guy's got. And I think that's very, very key to have the leadoff spot. Now you follow that with the, the middle of that lineup where you've got a guy you know is going to drive in 125 runs. He's going to hit 40 homers. That's big. That's big. So you've got to get some guys down ahead of him. And, you know, Andy, that goes to the number nine hitter. When you have a DH, that number nine hitter is big when you've got a powerful middle of your lineup because once you get that, he can't be an out. He can't be just a given out. You've got to have that guy is going to start the process of up the going up the ladder of these powerful hitters. Yes, I think they're a bat short. I think it's great that they're going to let Vientos and Beatty have shots. That's wonderful. I'm all in the young players. I spent over 25 years developing players, so I know how, the importance of it. But if you just say, look, we're going to ride these two young kids and see what we can, because you got a third guy in the catcher. Even though last year he hit some home runs, he still has propensity to strike out once in a while. So you've got three young bats in your lineup, and so you, to milk in somebody else that's you know, a potential uh, who's, you know, what he's going to kind of do because of the back of his baseball card. I think you're going to need one of those guys in that lineup again. But I like their club. I like the fact that they went out and they've improved their bench. I've said many times on many of the shows that you and I have done on SNY, you know what, I in 2015, and a lot of people talk about that 2015 club, I looked down that bench and we had major league players on that bench. You had Juan Arebe, Kelly Johnson, Michael Kadire. That made a difference. Now, we had pitchers hitting back then, so all of a sudden that other manager had to decide, hey, geez, if I pitchers coming up, who you know who are they going to send up there? It all depended on who you were going to pitch and what who you really wanted to face. So I think their bench, are you going to give somebody a day off? They've got quality, they've got some pretty good players to bring off that bench. So I like what David Stern has done, has done to put this team together. Now, you the biggest thing is we all know we got to keep them on the field. And again, I think the fact that they've got some of those quality bench guys is going to allow them to give those other guys a day off here and there and try to keep them healthy. But I kind of like them. Um, I know the season's so long, Andy. The one thing that they've done, you know, you know, five five stars, the days of the Atlanta Braves where you run five guys out there for the season, they're over. Those are over. You're going to need 12, 13, 14 starters, and I think they've got some guys. And as we develop some of that good minor league talent that we've been hearing about, uh, I've been in the minor league camp. Uh, they, they're raving about some of the arms they have down there. It's going to allow those guys to develop, and you got to push those guys, though. You know, there's no reason why, you know, you don't push those young players and, and challenge them to be to, so that they understand what the competition is like at higher levels. So I like their club. I think it's going to be a fun season. I'm not really caught up in how they get out of spring training. I'm I'm going to see how they develop as the season goes. Yeah, I I agree that I like some of their depth, and I I know you've spent some time at the complex too, and a little bit more recently than I have. I've been home a little bit, and one thing that's interesting is Andy Green, who obviously they brought in to run player development. And by the way, I like that bringing a field guy in to run PD when when so often that's like a data guy with a lot of organizations now. So. That goes back to me to the idea of Omar bringing in you to run player development in a, in a sense, former major league manager uh, w when you did that. So good hire, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, he's talking like they're a really pitching heavy system. And I, 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 I makes me feel like, oh, I'm either either you feel differently about that than a lot of the rest of the industry does. Or you see something that we don't or they're very confident in their ability to uh, develop pitching. It's kind of interesting because. I see them as having really good position player crop of prospects. I saw a lot of Drew Gilbert and um, a little bit of Ryan Clifford, a little bit of Acuna, uh, Jet Williams. And I was like, whoa, these are athletes, right? Whereas in the past, it's been your Vientos and your Beatties who have a bat, but maybe not five tool players. Uh, so I like the position player crop, but, but Green is talking like, no, we got all this pitching too. And I know there's some guys. But it's not like with the Wheeler, Harvey, Syndergaard, Matt's uh, generation of hype on these pitchers. So I'm pretty interested to see as the year goes on how many of these guys get a start or two or more and, and how they look. A, a, a Christian Scott has looked good in spring. Uh, Tidwell's a little younger, but he's got really good stuff. Vassal, you know, Jose Budo's a guy whose stuff is all of a sudden playing better than it did. So, yeah, there's pitching there. I'm, I'm interested in why Andy's so bullish on it publicly, uh, but we'll see. 
Yeah, and I, I, you know, I've I've been over there a couple of times. Now it's pretty funny. Every time I go go watch them, the Triple Eight and Double A team are gone. They're on the road, so I really haven't seen a lot of those guys, those younger players that you've talked about that they got via trades last summer. But you know, that's how you build organizations. I remember years ago. Uh, when I was managing in Houston, you know, we were in a pennant race and, and we, we needed bodies. And so I, I called my buddy, Jim Leland and said, look, we need, you know, we need another bat. Have you got some of you are willing to trade? And he said, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll trade Jeff King or we'll trade or, uh, Orlando Merced to you, but we want that young talent back because that's how we're going to get better. And I think that's what, you yeah. know, some of these teams have done. And so it, it, it for me, Andy, and I, and I've lived this and that's one of the reasons why I talk about it. I, and I love Andy Green. I spent the entire day with him uh, yesterday, and, and one of the things that I found is that he's he understands what it takes to be a success in the big leagues, and that's the kind of players he's, he's going to try to get them ready. And one of the things is to deal, learn how to deal with failure, and that's why I believe you've got to push these young guys. If they learn how to get through do, deal with failure in the minor leagues, they'll handle a heck of a lot better when they finally get to the big leagues because that's the biggest challenge. Mm-hmm. You know, you and I have talked about it for years. There's, they've said there's two kind of big major league players, the ones who have been humbled and the ones who will be. And it's how you get through that and how fast you get through it will determine how really a great a player you can be. Yeah, you know, and not to get too far down the side note of the player development approach, but I, just in, in coming up in the game as a writer and knowing a – I mean, Paul De Podesta called you a player development star when when you were interviewing for the big league manager job, and that certainly has been your reputation. So, I knew of you as like a player development, uh, a model of how that should be. And over the f- almost fifteen years since, we've watched player development become about specific skills, like the exit v- velo drills, right? Uh, velocity and spin for pitchers. It's almost like isolated skills rather than learning how to play the entire baseball game. So probably sometimes. You get players up at the big leagues who have an unbelievable tool or two or three, but don't know how to play the game, right? And so having an Andy Green, like you said, knows how to how to succeed in the big leagues, how to deal with failure, how to, I mean, little things, but I, I won't name the player because it was told to me off the record, but one of the hyped Mets prospects um, in a spring training game this year just went to third base in a relay play when he was supposed to be over by second base. And it's like, Something you probably should have learned already, but w- with Andy Green in charge of player development, you 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 trust that the Mets have someone in place who's probably going to get that across, so, as you would have in your day in, in in PD. Well, you know, one of the things that, that this team's got. I mean, we talked about hey, they they're going to need this, they're going to need that, and everybody thinks you know because Steve's got big deep pockets that he's just going to buy help. Sometimes that's not the answer. Sometimes the answer is in your own system. So with some yeah. of the depth they've got, it's going to allow some of these younger players to, to maybe take, get some extra bats and double A or something. But the idea is that, you know, when you look late in the summer, there's nothing like bringing those young, exciting players up because they can change the clubhouse, man. They've got, they come up with great energy and sometimes it just turns your club around. And when those veteran players see those young players come up and the way they go about things, it kind of helps them regain some energy late in the year. Yeah, that's a great point too. And we saw that across town last year. The Yankees, by the end of August, were headed toward, you're going to lose 90-some games, and people are going to lose their jobs, and it was going really, really bad. And they ended up 82-80, and 80 in part because you had Jason Dominguez come up. Everyone's excited. They had an outfielder, Everson Pereira, who struggled a little. But infusion of young talent sort of actually saved their season a little bit um, because all of a sudden there's something to cheer for and something to right. watch and some new energy in the room. So I'm sure that's exactly what you're talking about. And the Mets have that in droves when they want to call on it, whatever point in the year that comes. I agree with that. John, you got anything for Andy? Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, I just got back from spring training. I I know that uh, David Stearns and Steve Cohn met with the media uh, at two different points uh, uh, this spring. It really uh, looks like the Mets, for the first time in a long time, stability seems to be there finally yeah there's been a lot of dysfunction in the past give us your insight on this franchise now with Stearns coming in to be uh, the head of baseball ops with Cohen and his strategy philosophy it seemed there's a synergy there uh Mm -hmm. give us your take on the long-term uh future of the New York Mets with these two at the helm yeah, I think stability was a good word. I mean, continuity is obviously so important. You don't want an organization changing philosophies every year or two uh, as you get new heads of baseball coming in and out. And the Mets just had a real run of bad luck with off-the-field stuff with some 
some GMs that they couldn't have foreseen happening, but there really hasn't been any stability in, in the Steve Cohen era yet. Uh, but, you know, barring anything, any skeletons in the closet of people that we, that we haven't heard of yet, and I certainly haven't heard any whiff, I think that uh, Mendoza and Stearns are Boy Scouts, really. Uh, uh, now, don't play that clip if they ever do anything. Uh, but <laughs> really, these seem like good, solid people and people who aren't going to mess it up and people who are going to be there for a long time. That could be a tandem uh, that works together for a lot of years, I think, right at the top. And I don't know how long Andy Green's going to be there because he's I'm sure that's a guy that's going to see other opportunities come his way. Uh, but overall, uh, they have a group and they have a, a, a Stearns brought in a guy who doesn't get a lot of publicity him, Eduardo Brizuela, who was one of his top lieutenants in Milwaukee, who's now uh, right up at the top of the inner circle with the Mets. And he's going to be here a long time, I think, unless he gets another job. GM job somewhere else. So they have a nucleus of leadership that John, I agree that that is going to finally settle in. Uh, when you look at the most successful organizations, they usually have continuity and stability the Cardinals, uh, the guardians sl slash Indians, uh, the Yankees, uh, the A's Billy Bean, excuse me, Sandy Alderson, the Billy Bean, the David force for all those years, these teams that have these baseball operations traditions, uh, tend to have more sustained success. Yeah, and the fans, the fans today. I mean, they're all clamoring. They need another bat. JD Martinez. There's always all that talk. But you know, as a lifelong fan myself, and that's what I am more than anything else as a fan. Uh, I look at what they're doing, and I look at the moves that they made last year at the trade deadline to buy these prospects by you know getting mm -hmm. rid of Scherzer and Verlander and seeing what's being developed now. And the strategy of the team long term, hey, this year they want to be competitive. From what I'm seeing down in spring training, the pitching looks pretty good. I mean, mm -hmm. so far they look okay, and I mean, it ain't going to be world class, uh, but it looks like there's a foundation being laid right now that could really bear fruit for many years to come with the young guys. And then next year at the end of the season, no matter where this season turns out, Cohen may open up those purse strings again and say, all right, I'm going to try to get this guy or this guy or this yeah. guy. So I think yeah. the Met fans have got to be patient maybe for the first time in their life. Well, it's interesting because it's like a transitional time where they're trying to build toward the next winning team. Uh, but they're still, like you said, John, going to be competitive this year, plan on being competitive this year. It's definitely an improvement over like optimism going into a season. Like some of the teams that Terry was given in those early years – uh, before it really started to get built back up for 14 and 15 and 16 as it started to get better. It's like, I mean, I was your fourth outfielder one of those years, Terry, I think. <laughs> you know, if there'd been one injury, I would have gotten in at bat. I mean, it was like, we're not winning this year. Everyone knew it. <laughs> that was the way it was in spring. And Stearns is trying to do it a little differently, for sure. Uh, and then he's going to, and then of course the owner's going to splurge when the time comes on, on high end players, too. I, I agree. I, I agree. You know, uh, one thing. One thing about uh, Stephen Cohen, he, you know, besides being a, I mean, a great businessman and a good owner, he's a great fan of the Mets, and he's he he wants them to be competitive, and, and uh, he's going to do things in his his power to make sure they stay competitive. I really believe that. Before we let you go today, there's a couple other things. First of all, I know you have a book coming out. We want to talk about that, but your relationship with uh, with Terry Collins goes back a long time, and I I think it would be. Uh, cool for the listeners uh, of this podcast to kind of hear that history with Terry and share a couple of your favorite TC moments over the years. <laughs> oh, there's so many. I mean, just overall. And Terry, I got to say, when you when they were interviewing guys for the job, I think the the finalists when you got the job were yourself, Chip Hale, Wally Backman, and Bob Melvin. I believe those were that was the group. It was going to be one of you guys. And I remember thinking, just based on what I heard about what a drill sergeant you were. I was like, just don't let it be Terry Collins. He's never going to say anything. He's going to be tight all the time. He's like, that was all I knew was that reputation. And it turns out that it's the most um, rewarding probably relationship I've had in the game. You couldn't have been more different from the reputation. And I know we've talked about this. You evolved to some extent uh, over that decade that you were not in a managing job. And some of the narrative on you was clearly unfair um, because you were a guy who who was like happy to be there every day and smiling and laughing 
And you, you weren't a drill sergeant at all. I mean, you obviously took the game seriously, but John, like right out, out of the gate, his first press conference, and then into the first spring training. I remember you had to take someone either, either you have a good instinct for this or someone told you learn everybody's name because right away it was, well, you know, Andy, that's a good question. Well, you know, Adam, da, da, da. And that was a good start by you. And I'm thinking, okay, this guy cares about the relationships with us. And then getting into the first camp, John, it was all like, he was just interested in talking about baseball. And I don't know if you were like this with everybody, Terry, or if uh, you and I just had a, a certain way that we related to each other, but I could come into your office at the end of a bad loss as a beat writer and be like, look, I'm not trying to criticize you, but I don't understand why you didn't pinch hit this guy or something. And you go, oh, well, so-and-so was up third the next inning, and I know La Russa had a lefty up and da-da-da. And I go, oh, okay, that makes sense. And you always understood that I just wanted to learn. And you always, I always did learn. You, you saw the game so much more clearly, obviously, than I ever could with all your lifetime of experience and knowledge of it, that you were willing to just give me information and teach me about the game in a way uh, that most modern managers are too worried about the media or what they might say in order to do that. And you were funny. I mean, there was some, so when David, I was watching, I was in the waiting room here when you were talking to David. Um, and I remember the day that you named him, the day that you named him captain, you, you had the ass about something. And I still don't know what it was, but you were just so funny when you were angry sometimes too. And I remember they go, it was Kevin Burkhart who went to, he was like, okay, we have a live announcement down in the press room. We're going to go to Terry Collins. And do you know what you said on live TV? No. It was, here we go to Terry Collins. And you go, I can't see shit. That was the first thing you said. <laughs> and that broadcast like all over to everybody on SMY, the lights are in your face or something. And then you're just like, John Neese is the opening day starter. And by the way, David Wright's the captain. And then you warmed up. I was like, I don't know what you're pissed about. Something happened behind the scenes. <laughs> but like, you're just funny. Everyone's dying laughing. We saw it with the Tom Hallion thing was the most obvious example. But the great thing about Terry, John, that you'll learn too, is you, as you guys do this for hopefully a long time, is that when you have, when you're mad about something, you're hilarious. And I always appreciate that over the years too. And sometimes it was me. I mean, there were times, beat writer, manager, uh, where you, I'd get a call from you to wake me up in a hotel and you'd be like, what the shit is this headline? Blah, 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 you know, and, and then you'd get into it, talk about it. But it was always fun. It was always fun. That's the thing. But you, know, you can go on thing, YouTube and you can see so many of those press conferences. Oh, yeah. Amazing stuff. Go ahead, Terry. No, I said, you know, one thing I, I tried to, uh, you understand, know, and it, it has to be done in New York. It has to be done. And that is you have to have respect for the sports writer. I mean, they are such an, they have such an impact on you, the players, how the team's being looked at. You have to have respect for them. So you, once in a while, you got to have some fun with them. And I mean, you know, Andy, the one thing that you always did, it, you were honest. You mean, I, I never had to ha never had to worry about you writing something that wasn't true. And therefore, you know, yeah. hey, look, I don't, I didn't mind telling you something because I knew it was, you know, it was going to come out the way I wanted it to come out in the paper. I got to tell one more story too. And John, you can edit this out if Terry doesn't want it in there. We talk about your relationships <laughs> with the writers too. I'm not going to use names, but there was one guy that, that pissed you off with something he wrote that was unfair at one point, middle of your tenure somewhere. And uh, all of a sudden this writer puts out a report on Twitter that the Mets are in talks with such and such a free agent, John Smith, the free agent. And it was like, that doesn't make any sense at all. So all of a sudden there was like seven other beat writers shooting it down. Sources say the Mets are not on John Smith. This is not accurate. Da da da. And I went into your office and I was like, what the hell was that? And you go, well, so-and-so pissed me off. So I told him we were going to sign this player. <laughs> and then when the rest of you had texted me, I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, you started a trade rumor just to mess with a guy. You're like, yeah, <laughs> and it was just stuff like that. It's just I imagine that's what the game was like in the good old days. And you gave us that's the thing. I, it took me a while to figure out this point, I guess, as I was talking this through Terry. But I feel like I got an experience of covering a manager in the good old days of baseball when it was human, and you could talk, and you could joke, and you could argue, and go back and forth. And and um, I you know I was thirty one years old when. You got the job. You got yeah. I was thirty one when you got the job, and I must. I, I just felt like I can't believe this day and age at this young age. I have got this old school kind of experience with you. That that's what it was like. Such a such a treat. Uh, honestly, I'm being sincere now, but it really was a gift for me as a writer 
be able to interact with somebody who who treated us that way. Oh, we had a great we had a great relationship, and we still do to this day. So, so. yeah. John, let's find out. Oh, I want to hear about the book. I want to hear about the book. Andy. Yeah, there's a there's well, a book coming out, uh, the Yankee Way. I mean, this is the inside story of the Brian Cashman era. Tell us how it got started, and uh, you're getting incredible reviews from some of the beat writers, and even Michael Kay and Zach Britton. So tell us about uh, the book, uh, Andy, and how it developed, and it's finally coming out. Well, thanks for bringing that up. I I would say, and I know probably a lot of your listeners are Met fans, Terry understandably but the reason i wanted to write about the yankees uh was what we were talking about before the continuity whatever one thinks of the yankees or brian cashman he got there in 1987 as an intern and when he got there terry i'm sure remembers these days uh the way they got their information on the affiliates was he the cashman the intern would get into the office every morning in the bronx and it'd be like Get, pick up the voice. There's a voicemail message, or not even a voicemail, an answering machine message. This is Wally Moon, manager of Port, Port, uh, wherever, Port something. Uh, and uh, Andy Stankiewicz led off last night, first pitch at 7.08. He was one for four with a walk, a stolen base. Uh, following him, Kevin Moss, uh, two for three. And that's how the organization, now, now you have TrackMan. Now you can get biomechanical data on any minor leaguer and any player probably in the in Dominican Summer League too. So the fact that Cashman has been in the game from that to this, but like this is the perfect vehicle to tell the story about how the game has changed. Plus the Yankees. So you've got A-Rod versus Jeter, uh, Cashman versus Jeter, Garrett Cole now, and everything about him striving for perfection. These like big characters too, that the Yankees always have had. Um, and I just had a relationship with Cashman as a reporter subject for a long time. That was, um, like you uh, certainly not friends, but like there's a certain trust and respect that we have. So I was like, what would you think about opening up about some of this stuff? And the conditions he set were only if you don't make it like my book, you got to interview everyone else too. And don't present it like it's my memoir, but I will give you time if you do it that way. And I was like, that's what I would want to do. Absolutely. So I tried to talk to everyone living who's had an important role for the Yankees over the past three, de- four decades and there's some really interesting stuff, and there's so many unsung heroes. Terry, I know you, I'm sure you know Bill Livesey very well uh, through the game. But when Bill Livesey's a guy, so when Cashman, gave, one of the things that kicked off my, said the light bulb, like, I want to write this, is Cashman said, the story that's always told about the Yankees is wrong. I'm like, what do you mean by that? He's like, well, one thing, G. Michael, who I love, uh, gets all the credit. But Bill Livesey and Brian Sabian built this dynasty as much as Stick Michael did. And I was like, people don't really know that. Uh, and I ended up, Bill Livesey's in his 80s now. For those who don't know, he was, at different times, he ran player development. He ran the draft. He ran, he was all over the organization. And he set these philosophies that still, the reason the Yankees traded Jordan Montgomery for Harrison Bader is because of something Bill Livesey came up with in like 1985. I mean, really, like what the value is of a defensive center fielder and what the value is of Montgomery as a pitcher and how you rate his tools. And and I spent hours and hours and hours talking to Livesey about, you know, he has tool rankings for every position that he came up with. I don't know, how, Terry, how much you've dug into that because I know you've never been in that organization, but it's gone all over now, the player profile, where he decided, no, it's not just five tools divided by five and the players of, of 55. It's okay, you have a center fielder. What are the most important tools? Let's evaluate him by that. A catcher. Why do I care if a catcher has a run tool? He's a catcher. I care about uh, his hit tool and I care about his uh, throwing and I care about his def- field tool, right? So he's ranking all the tools for every position, coming up with all this revolutionary stuff in the 80s. And long story short, this stuff has such a reach in the game right now that Carlos Mendoza came up in that system. So the Mets are literally being run on a daily basis by somebody who, who, whose education was in this stuff. Rob Thompson, who last year was the, de- the defending national champion manager, obviously, was a huge Bill Livesey guy uh, who was using all this stuff. Glenn Sherlock, currently an important person on the Mets uh, coaching staff, was part of the committee that came up with so much of this stuff uh, back in the late 80s. So it just goes on and on and how much these ideas that fuel the Yankees actually – drive like every team so uh that's the stuff that i i was really learned so much from doing and and honestly 
I spent a, a, like an off season interviewing Livesey and Sherlock and uh, Thompson and all these other people about this kind of stuff. And then the next season starts and I'm like, holy shit, I see the game so much clearer than I ever did. It's like my eyes were opened from what these guys taught me. So that's what I'm hoping to convey in the book, I guess. Well, that's, uh, that sounds like a fascinating, uh, book. I can't wait to read it. I mean, just those inside stories about the development of the most successful baseball franchise in history and Cashman mm -hmm. running the show for so many years, the Yankee way, the untold inside story, the Brian Cashman era available for pre-order right now, coming out May 21st everywhere. Andy Martino, uh, great guest. I'm sure Terry, we'd love to have him back during the uh, He'll be back. Make no mistake. He'll be back. Oh, well, all, all Terry did was give me time for how many years were you made? Seven years. It all, it all is a blur right now. So I'll give you all the time you need. And, you know, speaking <laughs> of the Yankees, I don't know if the world knows this. There's an alternate world. that's not that hard to imagine in which Terry's the bench coach of the 2018 Yankees, right? If Aaron Boone doesn't walk through that door, Beltran's got mm. a shot at that job, and he was going to make you the bench coach, wasn't he? Yep. Wow. Yeah. So how about that? Uh, Terry Terry Collins himself might have been part of the Yankee way. If one <laughs> little thing in that interview process had gone different. Because I wouldn't be surprised if Beltran had got that job if, if Boone, in, in this amazing interview, won them over. But but Carlos had a shot at that, too, and Terry would have been his right, at his right hand. How well, about that? Andy, was, as always, it's a pleasure having you, being around you, listening to you. I thank you so much for – being on my first podcast, my first show, and and oh, I, I'll it have you, hope you're back for many, many more. Anytime, guys. Well, that was great with uh, Andy Martino, Terry. Um, I tell you, you know what an insightful guy, and what a great long friendship you've had with him, and uh, great segment, great segment. But now it's really time for the first uh, ever talking with TC. And we're excited about this one. So uh, let me talk to you, uh, everybody out there, and and you'll know who this is once I get into it. Uh, our first guest on Talking With TC played his entire career with the Mets organization, seven-time All-Star, two-time Gold Glover, two-time Silver Slugger award winner. His 1,585 games with the Mets are – the second most in franchise history, just behind Ed Cranepool. And he ended his career holding the franchise record for hits, runs, total bases, doubles, RBIs, walks, sack flies, and extra base hits. He got the nickname Captain America after the 2013 World Baseball Classic, hitting 438 in that tournament. But to the Met fans, he's simply known as the captain. It's an honor to welcome David Wright to the Terry Collins show. Thanks for having me. You forgot leader in strikeouts, <laughs> probably errors, and probably a lot of other things too. So uh, I feel honored to be the first guest. So thanks for having me, TC. Well, David, it is without a question an honor uh, to do my first show and have you be the first guest. I mean, it's uh, it's very cool. Our, our relationship is great, but, you know, it was so fun to watch you play for so long and you know, I, I I just thank you for coming on the show and and get kicking off this uh, initial prod podcast that I'm going to try to do this year. Well, you know, you're the best, and uh, you know I'd do anything for you. So thanks for having me, and I'm excited to talk some baseball. Let's do it. Yeah, I think we should. You know, David, I uh, as we were getting ready for this podcast, and and of course we all we were trying to discuss who was going to be on, and I said, you know, we got the the ideal guy, and I know he'll be on, and. And I said, you, you know, there's some things I've always wanted to ask you that I never really did get ever get to ask you. And that, you know, the one was, you know, when you when you got first to the big leagues, when you got called up the first time, you know, every rookie, you know, he comes up and his eyes are, you know, big and and he's so excited about being there. What guy in that clubhouse made an impact on your career when you were first first got to the big leagues? That's a great question, and there's a lot of them. But there's actually two that I've talked to in the last two days, so they come to mind, and that's Joe McEwing and Cliff Floyd. Uh, those two guys, for me, took me under their wing. Uh, Joe, uh, I lived in the same apartment building as Joe. He'd take me to the ballpark. He taught me how to get to the ballpark. This was before all the GPS and all that stuff. So I remember sitting in his pasture seat of his rental car, writing down directions as we're going um, you know, over the Triborough into Queens and 
take exit so and so and make a right here and a left here and uh, and then obviously Cliff Floyd um, really really took care of me. He taught me um, that you have two ears and one mouth for a reason to listen twice as much as you talk and to take it in because I had a veteran group and 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 a lot of those guys gave me a little bit that I tried to take from each of them, whether it's Al Leiter, John Franco, Mike Piazza, um, you know, and tried to apply it to my game. So I had a very veteran group, but those two in particular really took me under their wing. You know, you know, Dave, was there one thing, you know, as, you, as you're getting ready to play, was it the game prep? What was it that you took from them that you then initially – gave to some of the guys when, you know, when you were the captain or those young kids that, that were coming up, they're maybe still there today that, you you know, you said, Hey, look, th- this is a piece of advice that I got my first year. I've never forgot it. And, and you related to them. Anything come to mind? I remember being an 18 year old, my first spring training, semi fresh out of high school and, you know, eyes wide open, bushy tail, just so excited to be in Port St. Lucie for my first minor league spring training. And I remember we used to have early work and we'd get there at the crack of dawn, you know, maybe six, six thirty, eat breakfast and have our early work, say, starting at seven, um, which is early for a baseball player. And, you know, I remember walking out to the backfields and hearing this commotion going on on one of the backfields. And I'm like, you know, what is that? So I kind of I like be, being places early. So I mosey on back there and I see Mike Piazza, you know, arguably probably the best hitting catcher of all time, Hall of Famer working on his catching at seven o'clock in the morning on a backfield in Port St. Lucie in February or early March uh, in spring training. And that always stuck with me. And I always told myself, if Mike Piazza can go work on his defense at seven o'clock in the morning in spring training, when he's already at Hall of Famer, um, you know, I never can say that I'm good enough. I always need to keep working. And that, that, that lesson stuck with me. You know, that, that is impressive. And that's, you know, that's one of the, we'll, we'll probably get into it shortly, but that's where, you know, my time when I go back now and I watch the minor league kids practicing and stuff and, you know, that early morning stuff comes early, but, you know, there's no replacement for working. And, and that's where, you know, I've always thought, you know, your game prep was off the charts. Great. And, and you never missed a day. You never missed a workout. You never missed, you know, as you, as you got ready for the season, I remember, you know, you, we sat down one of the first days and we talked about how many at bats you needed for spring training and even in spring training, you said to me the one time about, you know, hey, look, I got to go back to back. You know, you don't, you, don't, you don't need a day off every other day. I need I need to go back to back once in a while. So, you know, I, those are things that as a manager, you know, you hear your star player talk about, hey, look, I want to work hard. That's the stuff I think that you know, plays that runs throughout the entire organization. And let me say this quickly. I remember Terry Collins running the minor leagues for the Dodgers when I was in the minor leagues for the Mets. And I remember that enthusiasm. And I remember – looking over at the Dodgers organization and thinking, you know, wow, this is this this is big time. And it starts with Terry Collins, who's running the minor leagues, running from field to field. And that's why I was so excited when when we hired you as manager. I wanted that enthusiasm. I wanted that excitement because I remember as a young kid seeing you kind of set the tone in that spring trainings or whether it's minor league games in the middle of August in, you know, whatever town when it's a million degrees. You know, I remember you setting that tone, and and that's why I was so excited, you know, to not only play for you, but to learn from you and kind of bring that enthusiasm to the big league level. Well, well, jump it in worked on that out. Because... No, go ahead, Terry. No, I was just going to say. So, David, you know, as as we get into this, and, and John, you want, if you want to add something, please jump in because you know, oh, yeah. the one thing about it, we're gonna we're gonna get how we, we know how he feels, and and he's not he's not going to pull any punches with us. I can tell you so. No, I, I no really because when I hear David talk about him seeing you running the minor leagues, uh, running spring training for the Dodgers, because uh, I always, I always loved seeing the interaction between you and David on the field during your tenure and David as a player. And this question was really for both of you. Uh, it was the first one I had for you guys. It's like there's no doubt about the mutual respect, the admiration you had for each other, and I wanted you to both talk about that bond and how it's endured to this very day. Uh, David first, and then to you, Terry. Okay. Well, I think one of, the, one of the things that always stuck with me, you know, besides Terry's enthusiasm and his upbeat, positive attitude, um, has always been that he had this open door policy where, you know, once a month, once, once every couple of weeks, he'd gather the veterans and we'd go in his office and we'd have kind of a state of the union per se. 
where Terry would be like, Hey, give me, give me what's going on in the clubhouse. Uh, give me how you're feeling. Give me, you know, what I could do better, what we could do better, you know, both, both baseball wise and off the field, the culture in the clubhouse. And that's something that having that open door policy and that line of communication with your manager, uh, I think is one of the most critical features um, maybe even more so than teaching the game of baseball is being in touch with your players and taking their temperature every now and then as to how are things are going because inevitably you're around these guys so much that you're going to get in these little spats or these little arguments or these little fights. <laughs> and the reason for these meetings is to kind of come back together and say, okay, let's hash it out. You know, if we got some issues, whether it's with, you know, the third baseman or the manager or the star pitcher, whatever it is, let's hash it out behind closed doors and figure it out and let's move forward. And I think that that's something that I always appreciated with Terry is that open door policy and that ability to communicate uh, with, with all the players. Well, you know, John, I, I will tell you the first time I met David, I, I had been hired as the field coordinator and it came down to Florida uh, in January to get ready. They, we opened up the complex here for guys and I was having dinner one night and uh this guy comes over and he said, just wanted to introduce myself. I'm David Wright. And I, you know, I'm thinking, wow, this guy came over to say hi to me. That's pretty impressive. This is the, you know, the star player. And that struck me so, I mean, I, I was so impressed by that, that he would take the time just to come over and introduce himself because, you know, he, he's a star. He didn't need to have to worry about that, but it was how he went about things after that. You know, when David talked about the open door stuff, you know, there were times, during a season where I, I knew I had to get this guy a day off. I mean, he, he's always played 155, 161 games, 62 games. So I don't know, every couple of weeks I would call him off. I'd come off to the side and I'd say, hey, look, I got to get you a day off this week. And, and he would say, what do you think? And I'd say, well, I mean, how about Thursday? And we, who's pitching? And I told him, I, well, maybe this guy. And, and he would say, I'll tell you after the game on Wednesday. <laughs> because that's his <laughs> love for the game. His, his, you know, his passion to play for the game. And, and that's what made for me, you know, this guy, want, he, he didn't want days off. He wanted to be on the field. He knew his worth to the ball club. And he just, even though he knew he probably would, could use a day off now and then, he knew his importance to the team. And that that's where I felt, you know, hey, look, the Stars, they get it. They understand how important they are, and they they're going to be out there. And this guy did it better than anybody else around. I mean, there were there were times that he, I, I he, this guy played. I mean, the year he got hurt, he never said a word. He just showed up, got ready, and played and played good and played. To, finally, his neck was still stiff. He probably couldn't turn it anymore, but he just kept playing and playing. But I tell you, to get this guy a day off was tough, man. I mean, really tough. You fought pretty. You know, hard, the other David. thing, John. I'll tell you the other thing I saw in in New York. Every person that ever came in if the community relations department or anybody else, the one guy they wanted to meet was David Wright. And so they would come in the clubhouse into the outside. They wouldn't come in the, in the main clubhouse, but they, there was a little room off to the side and they'd come in and say, Hey, David, I've got uh, uh, Joe Blow out here. He wants to meet you. And every time David grabbed the 30 seconds to a minute and went out and said hi to the guy. Now that's respect for the fans and for the game itself. And in that town, it played without a question. Hey, I remember when my nephew was, I think, five or six years old, we went to a game in Atlanta at the Weston Buckhead. And uh, and he saw David on the steps going up to uh, where the Palm Restaurant was there in, in Weston in, in Atlanta. And he goes, that's David Wright. I was like, well, I'm sure, you know, he'd say hello to you. And he goes, I'm afraid. And 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 then all of a sudden it's like I just said, David, do you have a second? And you came down and, and you took a picture with my nephew and he'll never forget it. And that was just so memorable. But, yeah, what a great – everyone wanted to say hello to David. And, and David, I don't know if you know this or even, Terry, if you know this. We're taping this on March 21st. And on March 21st, 2013, 11 years ago, David, do you have any idea what happened that day? Or should I refresh your memory? I mean, I have a, uh, a, a feeling that uh, this day had something to do with being named captain. That is correct. Uh, <laughs> on this day uh, in 2013, you were named the fourth captain in the history of the New York Mets. Uh, Gary Carter and Keith Hernandez were co-captains in the 80s. Johnny Franco, captain from uh, 2001 to 2004. You became captain in 2013. What did that mean to you at that time? And I want to talk to Terry about that, too. I want to get his opinion on that. And uh, what was that appointment of captain 
what did that mean for you at that time? And what should the role of a captain for a team in today's era be? You know, I'm glad you brought that up because every time you bring that up, it brings a big smile to my face. And looking at Terry uh, brings a big smile, too, because he was the one that got that delivered the news to me. And uh, one of the best days of my career, um, you know, certainly um, being viewed in the light um, of a, you know, a Terry Collins and his coaching staff and the front office and ownership and players um, in that kind of role um, was something that I took very seriously. And to this day, um, I feel like one of the biggest honors uh, that I've ever received. So, um, you know, for to be viewed as as a captain or a leader for the organization, for the city, uh, for the fan base, for my fellow you know players, uh, you know, was incredibly amazing. And you you could see by the smile that it's something that um, you know I cherish to this day. You know, John, I, I will tell you, <clears throat> I went, I approached David at that spring and, and asked him if he ever, you know, that I would, would like to name him the captain. And he said, I, I don't, I don't think so. And I said, well, think about it and get back and we, we'll talk about it again. So we talked about it later and he said, I want it before I, before we talk, I want to go find out about with my teammates, how they would feel about it. And that is why one of the reasons why I wanted him to be the captain I didn't want him to make speeches. I didn't want him to have to get up in front of the club and give a pep talk. I wanted him to lead by example. You, you've already heard him about him talk about, you know, that he's on the field an all seven time all star at seven o'clock in the morning in the cage, taking ground balls, um, his respect for the fans, signing autographs, taking a picture with your nephew uh, in, you know, in a hotel on the road, the respect for the media in New York. You know, always available. When and there's a lot of places you won't find this, but in New York, you have to be in front of your locker when that game is over. This guy's in front of the locker. You know, he, he answered the questions. He answered them properly. His respect for his teammates. I mean, all of those things are what, for me, is what leadership is. It isn't about how good a talker you are. It's about how you go about things. And you know, and I used to ask, I used to ask David, uh, hey. You, can you talk to so and so? Because I thought his impact as a peer player had a lot more clout when he would talk to a player about an issue, as as opposed to the manager. You know, the players get tired of hearing the manager talk, but when you have someone that that locker next to you who's going through the same things you're going through, who's been through the same things you're going through, you know, it, it means a lot more. And this guy never said no, and that's why he was for me the ultimate captain. And today's day. Uh captains there are not very many of them really and i know the mets have several guys well maybe this guy should be a captain lindor shows his leadership abilities of course pete alonzo is the, the you know kind of the face of the organization uh and uh, what does the role of a leader mean today i mean has it changed uh, you think the role has changed if someone is appointed captain today uh, in comparison to when uh, david you were playing you know, I think for me, it was something that I never wanted to do different. You know, I, I think that I was honored with that title for a reason. And I didn't need to change something or become all of a sudden this boisterous, loud, speech giving motivator that, you know, just really wasn't me. There was a time and place to, you know, get on somebody or there was a time and place to hold a team meeting and to get up and, and say a few words. But I always respected and followed the types of players that, um, didn't do that very often because when they did do it, it meant a lot more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I reserved that for, and, and Terry and I talked about it before, you know, we'd go through a stretch where we just stunk and, you know, I'd look at Terry and be like, Hey, uh, you know, how you feeling? You know, you think now's a good time. And, and we'd have that dialogue. And that's what made it so great is that, you know, I wanted to, to, to hear what Terry thought as well. And, you know, when, you know, I accepted that, that role as captain, you know, I wanted to lead by example. And I, I think that I made it a point to even try to do that harder, you know, once I was named captain, because I wanted these young guys that came up in New York to not necessarily, you know, follow me because I was loud and boisterous and yelled in front of the cameras, but I wanted them to follow me because I tried to be the first one to get my work done. I tried to be the first one in the weight room. I tried to be the first one, you know, out on the field for stretch. I tried to you know, make sure that these young players saw me get my work in and, and, and followed, 
that example to, to be on time, to play the game the right way, to, uh, you know, to be courteous, to, you know, do the things away from the field that you're supposed to do. So, you know, that was very important to me. So um, that would be the role that I foresee uh, other organizations or this or the Mets organization, um, you know, when naming another captain or the next captain is, you know, somebody that is genuine, somebody that's organic, somebody that's doing it for the right reasons, not just because there's a, a camera in front of their face. Mm -hmm. You know, John, and I think what David's come from is very true, but you know, we, we all make it sound, make it a little bit sound like, you know, he was all, I mean, which he was all business, but you know what he did? He lightened up the clubhouse. This guy is a fun loving person. Don't let him get you. It was dedicated as he was to his job. He made the clubhouse fun. You couldn't walk in the clubhouse without having two or three guys sitting around him, and they were laughing. They were laughing about something. I mean, and so he lightened up the entire clubhouse. I mean, if it was, you know, he's the one who said, hey, we need the belt. We, you know, that year he, he went out and got the yeah. belt that we gave the player of the, player of the game. And guys had enjoyed it. They enjoyed coming in the clubhouse. And, and I've talked to you before, John, you know, I used to be in the clubhouse a lot probably more than I need managers should be, but I enjoyed being in there. And every time I was in there and if he got up to move, three guys turn their heads to see what, or what, you know, what is, what's he going to do? And, and that to me, and again, this, the example that he set, and, and I'm not sure players today, you know, understand that. I, I really don't. There's, they're so caught up. There's so much media and social media and all the other things, you know, and it's it, when the, behind those closed doors are where it, where it plays, where, you know, they, you hang that ego on those doors before you walk in that room. And, and that's what I think, you know, David did. And I, I'm not sure today's players are like that. And I, I just think he learned that as he came through, but you know, you got to have fun at the ballpark and he, and David created fun in our clubhouse. Yeah. And that's a, and that's a, actually a, a great point. And, and, you know, by Terry is that I do think that, and Terry and I have had conversations about this and, you know, I think we came to a, a point where we said, you know, an hour before game time at home, there's so much downtime. You get there so early, uh, you got batting practice first. There's a lot of downtime in between batting practice and the game. And, you know, it's inevitable that players are going to pull out their phones or players are going to want to play cards or players are going to want to, you know, we had a little mini basketball hoop that guys would shoot from in the clubhouse. You know, it's inevitable that guys are going to want to do this. But I think that, you know, like Terry said, you got to have fun because in, in the grand scheme of things, it's a bunch of big kids playing a game for a living. But, you know, we agreed that I think it was an hour before the game that stopped. And we started preparing, going over game plans, going over video, uh, starting mentally prepare for that game. So I think that there is a, like Terry said, uh, which I think is often overlooked, that that camaraderie, you know, that, hey, after a tough loss, let's go out and grab some dinner after the game and let's let's talk some baseball or let's talk like, hey, what's going on? You know, just to free things up so that when we come back to the field the next day, we're playing for one another. I know that the guy to the right of me, um, you know, is, is having a baby and that's stressful and that he's not getting much sleep at night. And therefore, you know, we're pulling in the same direction and that we have that unity because we know each other, not only as players, but we know each other away from the field as well. Yeah, you, uh, both of you have seen changes in the game, obviously. And, and there's, you know, each, there's generational changes that have happened in baseball. Uh, young, a lot of young guys that are coming in. What changes have you both seen with some of the younger players that are getting into the game now compared to your era? Well, for Terry's case, they're starting to wear helmets now. <laughs> That wasn't funny. Dude. <laughs> I know, I know. Go, go, you go first, Skip. Go for well, it. Well, you know, obviously the game is changing, and so you know, when I when I first came with coming up, and I it's stuff I even taught when I was managing. You know, you you talent talent plays, John. Talent wins, and so what you try to do is you take that talent and try to teach them how to win and the importance of winning and how to win baseball games. Sometimes you got to pass the baton to the next guy. And, and now it's all wrapped. Everything's wrapped up in what each and every guy does, what his numbers dictate. I mean, I've, I have spent a couple of years when I left managing the Mets, I went through the minor leagues and, and, you know, the analytics started to come in and guys were more concerned about their numbers than how they executed stuff on the field. And, and I, I mean, this past last year, I went to I watched a lot of minor league games and after the games, I would talk to some of the guys and they're saying, well, geez, my exit velocity was down. Well, you didn't make contact three times. So who, who, you know, 
why don't you why don't we start working about you know a two strike approach to put the ball in play and, and so maybe that that stuff changes but because that is what everybody looks at now that they've gotten away from the ultimate thing and that is in in our game is to win at the major league level and for me that starts in the minor leagues and so these young players you know do they learn how to win in the minor leagues i'm not sure because everybody downplays winning and winning in the minor leagues i when i was a minor league manager you know, I got accused, hey, look, you want to win too much. I said, yeah, when that guy goes to the big leagues, when my player gets to the big leagues, I want him to be able to contribute to winning. Tom Lasorda did not care if what somebody hit in AAA until they got to the big leagues and they showed him he, they could help him win, he could, they could help him win a baseball game. And I'm not sure today, and again, I, I, I don't sit in meetings in the minor league clubhouses anymore, but I just, when I watch the minor league game, it's not played the same. And I think there's a way that, you know, to get good players, talented players. And I'll tell you one thing. The guy that's on the screen right now, he wanted to win every night. He wanted to win. And when we didn't win, he tried to figure out how tomorrow we can win. And I don't think – I bet you – you could ask David how many nights he cared. How about – you know, I watched one game. He got a base hit to right field off Mariano Rivera to win a game. And I don't think he cared if it was 100 miles an hour or 25 miles an hour. It landed where nobody was at, and we won a game. And I think that's where, you know, the players today are kind of getting away from that and so worried about the stuff that's showing up on TV. Yeah, no, I, 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 I couldn't agree more. I think that there is certainly a place for the analytics. And I think Terry did a wonderful job when he managed in taking the numbers and utilizing them. You know, I think knowledge is king. You know, if you have the knowledge of the analytics and the feel of a, a baseball mind that Terry had, you can combine the two and have a perfect marriage. And I think that that's what makes managers great and what makes managers um, relatable to the players is having that feel, but also having the knowledge of the analytics. But I'm with Terry a thousand percent. I think that not only in the professional level, but at the amateur level and on down that we're not teaching these kids how to play the game correctly. You know, I think that we are, the game is changing to the point where, like Terry said, it's, you know, these different numbers when taking batting practice as opposed to working on a feel that's going to be successful in the game. Um, I think that the situation should dictate uh, your mindset or, 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 or the game plan that you bring to the plate per at bat. Every at bat isn't the same. There's going to be a time where you need to get a runner over. There's going to be a time where you need to get a runner in. You know, there's going to be a time where, hey, you're 3-1, sitting fastball, let it eat. You know, swing as hard as you can. You know, but that's not every situation. So I think that there needs to be a marriage between the two of that feel and that teaching the game correctly and playing the game correctly with the analytics. Hmm, very good point. Yeah, there's so many changes today. Uh, but I'm going to go back in time for a minute, David. Um, your relationship with Jose Reyes. Mm -hmm. I can't begin to tell you how much joy the Met fans felt when you guys were both emerging. I mean, I've been a lifelong Mets fan since I was nine years old. I went to my first game in 1966. And there's been a lot of ebbs and flows, a lot of ups and downs. We were so starved for stars. And you and Jose emerged at the same time. Really, you became stars. Uh, the fans loved you. One of my fondest memories was in 2006, seeing you and Jose celebrating on the field with the cigars, with the champagne, holding the signs. Uh, and that was just incredible uh, that night. Um, and uh, it was a lasting, lasting memory. And then, of course, you know, time passes. Twelve years later, you're at your final game. And to your left, Jose Reyes is there. And uh, mm -hmm. what an, an emotional night it was for the entire city of New York. And to see you and Jose embrace when you were leaving that game uh, was a memory that um, everybody remembers today. It'll, it'll live uh, in everybody's memory in Mets history. What did Jose Reyes mean to you as a teammate, as a friend? And do you guys still stay in touch with each other? Yeah, the short answer is that we're we were brothers. Um, you know, I remember being 18 years old, Jose, right around the same age. 
Guy Conti, who was running our minor leagues at the time, who's a good friend of both Terry and I's, um, pull us in the office. Um, and I'm 18 years old. I think I did something wrong or, you know, my mind is starting to race. Like, what is, what is the boss going to say to me or what did I do wrong? And he pulls us in and we start talking a little baseball. You know, we start talking amongst ourselves and he ends the conversation with, you guys are going to be the left side of this infield for a long time at the big league level. And I remember both of us walking out of that at 18 years old and like, wow, <laughs> um, you know, we got to, you know, and that made us want it even more. Having that, that, that relationship, having that confidence walking out that door of that meeting, you know, I'll never forget it. And from that day on, you know, it was almost like we wanted it together. We didn't want it individually. You know, we didn't want it for ourselves. We wanted it for each other. And that was the way that, that, that we played the game. You know, we went through a, a lot of ups, a lot of downs, but the constant was that Jose knew me just as well as I knew myself. I knew him just as well as he knew himself. And it was so funny how two kids from completely different backgrounds, speaking two different languages, eating two different types of food, listening to two different types of music could bond at that level and become have a brother like relationship. So, um, you know, one of the best friends that, that I've had in the game, um, and it just is, is a comfort level. When I look to my left, I want to see Jose Reyes manning shortstop because I know where he's going to play certain hitters that makes me play a certain place. And we don't even have to go over the scouting report. I know by where he's playing or what his body language is, he could communicate with me that way. And that's how well we knew each other. Yeah. That, uh, that chemistry was evident and you just mm -hmm. knew looking at you play and uh, that last game was just a, it was an amazing memory it really was Terry. Back to you. Well, thanks, David. I'm going to let you go. I just want to thank you again for all your time tonight. Um, you mean a lot to me. You mean a lot to this organization. Obviously, one of the you know one of the all time great great Mets and one of the all time great players. And uh, I know you're enjoying your time with your kids. You should um, have some fun. I look forward to seeing you down the road here pretty soon. And uh, again, thank you so much for being my first guest on my first show. Well, you're the best, and at some point, my three-year-old boy, I'm going to send him down uh, to Florida to have you teach him some baseball, you know, because I want him playing the game the right way. So thanks for everything you've done for, you know, my career. Um, thanks for, you know, being a friend, and, and hopefully I'll see you again soon. Thank you, David. I can't begin to tell you how great that segment with David Wright was, Terry. Yeah, he. I mean, he's the best. He's the best, and – one of the most, he's not just was one of the great players. He's one of the great people you'll ever be around. It was a pleasure to have him on. It certainly was. And uh, he looks happy. He looks healthy. And uh, the synergy, the love between you guys was evident. And uh, the thank you for getting David to come on the very first show today. It's amazing. Uh, but we have a lot of fans out there that like to talk to Terry, too. And uh, we, uh, we sent out a notification on Twitter. Uh, there's an email address, and we got some responses. So why don't we get into some of those uh, questions? This could be our fat, uh, our very first Ask the Skipper segment, and uh, we got an email, Terry, from uh, somebody named Russell O'Brien, and uh, he simply had the question: Terry, do you, on occasion, stay in touch with Ioannis Cespedes? Does he still own his ranch near Port St. Lucie? I'm really curious about that. Russ O'Brien. Uh, Russ, to be honest, I do see Ioannis. Um, he does live here still in Port St. Lucie. He still has his ranch. Um, I, I see him occasionally. I used to see him a lot at the golf course. He now is doing a lot of things in Cuba, so he goes back and forth a lot. He's not playing as much golf, but uh, I've had dinner with him. Actually, a year and a half ago, I had dinner with both Ioannis and Carlos Beltran at the same time, and uh, I just sat there and listened to him talk, and it was a great experience. I had dinner with Ioannis uh, just a few months ago and sat with him and talked about his experience with the, in the World Baseball Classic and actually talked about him. Is he going to try to make a comeback? And I see, and he kind of hemmed and hawed about it, but I said, if there's anybody that I've ever been around who can do it, it's him. This guy was one of the most talented physical tool player that I have ever seen in my life. And, and I really believe that if Ioannis really, really wanted to do it, uh, enough. He he would come. He could make a comeback. 
Well, he was amazing when he was on. I tell you, I haven't seen guys hit with that much power uh, really since then. It's amazing. Another question came in, this time on X, formerly Twitter. And this is from at Mets Vent Page. Aside from David Wright, who was the best leader you had on your Mets teams? Well, I was I was blessed. I mean, obviously, when I first got there, David was the guy, and that's why we named him captain. But, you know, in 20 – actually, when I first got there, one of the guys I was most impressed with in the clubhouse and on the field was Joh- Johan Santana. I ran a, a drill, John, in spring training one year and when I was the field coordinator and Jerry Manuel was the manager, where Johan stopped the drill – right in the middle of the action and told all the other pitchers, let's just do this right. Let's be out. Let's get it over with. Let's do it right. Let's do it at game speed. So we get something out of the drill. I mean, I've never heard that from anybody in all my years on the field. That tells you what kind of a leader he was. But when David went down in 2015, we need somebody to step up in our clubhouse to kind of, kind of take control. We had two guys, Michael Kadir, who we had just signed as a free agent and and Curtis Granderson. Those two guys, they their personalities, their leadership skills, both on the field, in the clubhouse, uh, on the planes, we, we needed that bad because David was not around, and they did a tremendous job. Excellent. Thanks for that question. Uh, Mets Vent Page at uh, X. Final question. Um, this comes from Chris. He's at Vitamin CM on X. And Terry, this is not the only question we got about this topic. Um, when we put out the notification that we'd like fans to ask questions, we got an overwhelmingly one-sided, many, many questions about this. So we're going to give you a chance to answer it here. Chris asks, will Terry have Tom Hallion on to break down the ass in the jackpot incident? That would be must-see TV. Terry, what are you going to do about that? Well, Chris, I will tell you this. I, I hope you're available next week because the guest next week is Tom Hallion. I have talked to Tom. He's can't wait to get on. We can't wait to talk about the entire situation. He will explain his where he came up with the expression that his ass was in the jackpot. Uh, it's a great story, ah. um, and I'm looking forward to it as much as anybody else to have a, to have a conversation with Tom Hallion. And is this the first time that you guys have spoken publicly about what happened there? It's the first together? time. You know, and, and John, I, I, do, I do a lot of different appearances in New York and down here. And every person said, you know, you should do something with Tom Hallion. So this is the first time that the two of us have ever sat and discussed uh, that that video that came out. Hey, if you're going to give anyone an exclusive, you might as well do it on your own show. <laughs> good, good point. Good point. <laughs> Uh, we're going to look forward to that. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. Submit your questions to Terry either by email or social media. Just send the email to the Terry Collins Show at gmail.com or go to Terry's Twitter or Instagram at Terry Collins underscore 10. And don't forget to follow Terry on social media there. Uh, make sure you subscribe now to the Terry Collins Show wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and on YouTube so you get notified first when a new episode drops. Uh, We're going to be back first week of April to take a look at the Mets' first week of the 2024 season. And as Terry said, all of our asses are going to be in the jackpot (laughs) when Terry gets his shot with umpire Tom Hallion on the next Terry Collins show. Uh, Terry, it's been an amazing day. Uh, Great first show. We can't wait till next week. Uh, I, I'm the same, John. I, I've had a blast. You know, I, I, when you asked me to, to participate in this, uh, I wasn't sure what to expect, and I've been really enjoyed today, and I, I can't wait till next week. Same here. This is John Arezzi for Terry Collins. We'll see you all next week. Let's go, Mets.